Uh, just for those of you who don't know me, I'm the CTO here at PrimeKey, and I've been doing PKI since when we didn't have flat screens. So PKI is fun, uh, which is why I li loved uh, the previous talks here. So hardcore PKI has uh, been a recurring three theme on tech days. Um, so maybe I'll have to figure out something else uh, for next year, so I don't repeat myself all the time. But uh, I figured out something new this year, I think, at least. So this year's hardcore PKI is, you know, why do you make PKI so hard? We even heard PKI is tough. It is. So why do you guys make PKI so tough? I mean, we have Cab Forum, we have ADAS, uh, we have Common Criteria, FIPS, Post Quantum Crypto. This um, is not easy stuff. And then you mix in, you know, do you want on-premise, cloud, managed, HSMs? You know, it has to be usable, of course. Crypto, agile, and operations is not easy either. Standards, monitoring, end-to-end, -end, encryption, etc., etc. So. This is why it's why is it so hard? Well, of course, for us it means more work for us. Yeah, we like that. But uh, I'll try to answer my own question first. So why PKI is hard? So as we've uh, seen uh, some of our previous uh, presentations here, PKI is kind of a foundational security infrastructure, which is the security infrastructure for everything, critical infrastructure, the internet, uh, identification, telecommunication, IoT, everything. So the answer to the ultimate question you know, of life, the universe, and, every and everything is not 42, it seems to be PGI. And as such, if you compare it with anything other global infrastructures, you know, it looks very easy on the surface, or for a consumer, it should be easy. It's very easy to use my cell phone to open a web browser and connect to my bank and do bank payments. But what happens underneath, it's extremely complex with you know, just an iPhone or Android operating system. Then there's 4G networking in, uh, behind them. Yeah, there's PKI in there as well, somewhere. But it's uh, extremely complex. It's easy for the consumer, but uh, it's hard uh, for us. And, do guys implementing it, and that's uh, us here, basically. So uh, that's why it's it's hard. But we need to try to make it a little well as easy as possible for uh, the other poor for 200 uh, telcos is going to have to implement PKI. Uh, they shouldn't have to be PKI experts, all of them. And you know, the PKI guy probably will not be able to run around to all of those 200. Uh, neither uh, Mark or we will be able to do that unless we make PKI a little bit easier to consume. Because as an infrastructure, everyone must act and you know, everyone must do something. So and that's what we're uh, trying to do now. Uh, the good thing with uh, what we also just heard with PKI is that for all new use cases, the, say, the trusted old X509 PKI infrastructure is basically the same. There are some new uh, details on top of it, but the, there is a very solid foundation which is luckily the same. Uh, yeah, we had, we were playing, planning on having a quiz yesterday, but it turned out to be too crowded, so we couldn't have it. But one of the quiz questions I uh, was anticipating or planning on was to, you know, do you know when the PEM standard, which everyone uses and have printed on T-shirts nowadays, when it was originated? So it was back in 1987 with RFC 989. You know, imagine an RFC less than a thousand. So just imagine how easy PKI and everything was back then compared to now. Anyhow, to continue, so why do we make it hard? So many times you wish that you know, a car was just another device, a certificate to communicate between banks was the same as a certificate communi to communicate with your bank, um, but for some reason it's not. 
sometimes there are partly unique challenges to all these different problems, be it uh, robocalling or automotive uh, or, or anything else. Uh, but sometimes it's just kind of not invented here syndrome or other, I wasn't aware that someone else has been doing the exact same thing for 10 years, so I have to reinvent the wheel again anyhow. So there are many factors uh, factoring into why things are hard and why things that are should be the same are not the same. So you have to do slightly different work, which takes a lot of time and resources. Uh, well, but luckily, as I said, the underlying infrastructure is the same, which is why we still call it PKI. Uh, but I know you are all here for the details. So let's get into the details. So what are the differences? You know, we have the nice foundation PKI, but with a little use case specific spice on the top, which keeps you know, all our 10 plus developers busy year round and still don't have time to implement all of this extra spice. So yet more options during the last year. One thing is uh, ADAS, so I'm going to give ADAS a bit of a, a bashing. So there's a new HSM out for ADAS, which uh, Martin explained as well. So, and yeah, we can use it uh, through PKC 11, but uh, it's not PKC 11. So there's new mandatory functions for this ADAS HSMs. And one of, of them are this key authorization, as you can see up to the right. So where you can have to define after you Today, you generate the key and you can start using it for OCSP, signing certificates, etc. Now, you generate the key and then you have to authorize its usage for unlimited uh, amounts of signatures or for a, a uh, limited specified amount of signatures. So that uh, makes you know, the, a GUI for keys, which were just had a key, you can test it, remove it, generate it. And now you have some new fields where you can authorize the usage of this key. And yeah, it, it looks neat, but uh, one question I have to ask is, does it make sense for a CA or a timestamp authority or an OCSP responder? I mean, when you generate keys for an OCSP responder, would you limit it to 10,000 signatures? Probably not. So does it make sense in this context for some certain digital signatures? Yeah, there's probably use cases where it makes a lot of sense but it's mandated in cases where it may not make sense either. I'm happy to be proven wrong, but uh, does it make it easier to use? Probably not. Uh, does it make it more secure? Um, well, some use cases, yes. Some use cases, no. Uh, another thing, so there are, we also have PSD2, another EU invention. Where I was actually thrilled because what they have done in PST2 is reuse uh, ex existing work. They are reusing the EDAS infrastructure. So that's just that's fabulous. You know, don't invent a new kind of security infrastructure for PST2 when we have EDAS. So that's uh, uh, fantastic. But of course, they had to invent their little spice. And uh, it's hidden in the qualified certificate statement to the yeah, left here. And uh, the qualified certificate statement has become kind of Etsy's own playground uh, lately. So it has become a profile of its own. You have a lot of certificate profiles for different use cases, and then you have a huge qualified certificate uh, profile as well for different use cases. And uh, well, they baked a, PS a new PSD2 attribute in there, which is a little bit different from other attributes, usually the qualified certificate statement is a static field depending on certificate type. Is it a seal, is it a signature, etc. But the PST2 thing is uh, unique per uh, certificate issued or per entity who will receive the certificate. So there's, uh, you have to add it in the qualified certificate uh, statement. You have to add it when you issue a certificate for each entity who will get the certificate. And then uh, as they uh, also specified it's a web authentication certificate, so TSPs 
have decided they want to issue it from also publicly trusted web PKIs, which is governed by the CAB forum and web browsers. So there was a little bit of uh, discussion there. And it turned out we need, uh, yes, another field, uh, which is a uh, new extension, uh, the CAB forum organization identifier. So there's you know, plenty of uh, spice for PSD2. And yet more options, there's also, uh, well, showing that you shouldn't always be too fast to implement things. Uh, certificate transparency used in the web PKI. You know, there was a discussion to, uh, or uh, one step back. So currently there are certificate transparency logs which accepts only certificates that expire within a certain year. So there was a d discussion at some time that you should be able to more granularly define this uh, sharding of certificate transparency logs. Uh, so uh, our team implemented that. Turns out there are no logs who are planning to introduce such detailed sharding. So maybe it was in vain we did that. So maybe we should have waited a little bit and spent the time on something else. Only time will tell if we were early good or if we were early uh, waste of time. Some other interesting uh, things that have happened this year is uh, validation. You have to validate everything nowadays. So there are detailed specifications, for example, in uh, CAP Forum baseline requirements, uh, what an RSA key must fulfill. So you validate uh, all these fields that you see on the left for uh, when you issue a certificate with an RSA public key. But yeah, as the PKI is so complex, it is uh, too complex to do, you can say, formal validation. So there's always another detail which you didn't validate, which on the internet scale, it shows up. In this case, it turned out, well, it's kind of well known that an RSA public key in a certificate uh, or the public key field has a key field and a parameters field. For an RSA key, there are no parameters, so the field should be null. But it shouldn't be null as missing, it should be encoded in ASM1 as, as null. Uh, it's a special encoding. And uh, of course, there's some software out there who issue certificate requests with the wrong encoding, which doesn't really matter. Uh, because nobody, everyone knows that our key doesn't have any parameters, so nobody tries to read it, so nobody actually notices it. Everything works just fine anyhow. But if you look into the encoding, uh, you will see, oops, it's uh, wrongly encoded, and you will have to uh, revoke and reissue uh, by form, so to say, because there are things that are security relevant, which you have to do, and then there are things that may not um, be so important from a secured perspective, but you have to follow the rules anyhow. Uh, next thing was a thing that we got great help from David Hook by. We got questions about popo verification failure of a certificate request that came in to some uh, customers. Popo means proof of possession, which is a self-signature on PKCS10 requests. And it's not easy to uh, figure out why does a signature verification fail because it's a you know, uh, public key operation over a binary data set. So yeah. With some help uh, from David, we figured out that, okay, it's a specific CSR when there's a multi-value RDNs instead of each field as a separate field. And then the uh, their encoding, which was used to produce the signature, was not calculated correctly because ordering of this unordered set has to be uh, done according to X69, uh, X690, etc. So, of course, there's some software out there that generates these invalid CSRs, and because OpenSSL swallows it and accepts it, everyone thinks that there's something wrong with uh, our software or Bouncy Castle. Uh, because OpenSSL is the de facto standard. But sometimes they don't do it right, and uh, we don't accept it for the right reasons. But then, of course, there's always a risk that, okay, they can take their CSR and go to another CA, and maybe they will be accepted there. So uh, that's tricky. So those were kind of some technical details that have been uh, plaguing us in the, uh, the last year. 
And then some uh, fun stuff that we have been playing with is uh, hybrid and multi-cloud things. Uh, the teams have been trying to, or playing a little bit with kind of scaling up and uh, testing these kind of things in uh, cloud or container and uh, cloud environments. So from uh, our point of view, a hybrid environment, which is you can do kind of cool things with PKI. In a hybrid environment, you can have your uh, root CA on premise or in a private hosting uh, with, uh, with a partner, for example, or in a say a local provider like Elastix is a local Swedish provider of Kubernetes, private Kubernetes clouds. So there you can have your, say, private PKI. And then you can scale up and down in uh, you know, public clouds like Azure, AWS, or uh, Red Hat OpenShift. So you can put uh, timestamp authorities, OCSP, issuing CAs there. And uh, you can scale up and down with uh, multiple nodes as, as you want. So the, our cloud, cloud team will uh, give you some numbers, I think, on their presentation. But you can, if you need more OCSP, just fire up new ones. If you need more, if you need to issue more than 200 certificates per second, just fire up a bunch of new issuing CAs in the cloud. And if, well, close to the uh, end users, well, do it uh, in Japan or Asia or Africa or Europe, etc. So that's kind of that's fun, a lot of funny things for us PKI geeks, but then. When it comes down to real installations, we see that most installations, you know, from a performance point of view, they cope with a, a single node. Uh, you know, a single laptop in a closet will be enough to satisfy most PKI performance needs. Usually, you have multiple nodes in order to satisfy redundancy reasons, or uh, you know, geographic separation, and you know, of course, if one machine crashes, uh, everything should still run, etc. So that's why you know you balance a little bit. Do you need a single uh, laptop in a closet, or do you need a, a multi-cloud, global, uh, scalable deployment? And related to the uh, second one and automation, we also have uh, Johan has been playing with containers for the last year or so. So if you need want to uh, talk containers, I think Johan is is here somewhere. And some cool things that we played with or that Johan played with was the, you know, Kubernetes uh, who has a certificate manager who can talk Acme. So if you have a Kubernetes uh, installation with a certificate manager and an EGBCA talking Acme, you can just pour in a YAML file on top there. You pour that into Kubernetes, press the play button, it works a little bit and uh, up spawns a full, uh, say, nicely best practice PKI with a separate backend database. You have a CA node in the middle, and you have a front end isolating the uh, CA node. And the front end will get, or an ingress in the Kubernetes language, will get a uh, web certificate automatically uh, provisioned by Kubernetes, fetching it from Acme. Uh, so as the de into details, if you know Acme, it's all about domain validation. So this ingress needs to have a domain that the CA can validate through Acme. And that has, is done by the, uh, the certificate manager will subscribe to a create API and talk Acme to the CA. And uh, during the deployment, it will modify the ingress to authorize this domain. And then you can configure auto-scaling. So if you need more nodes, it can launch more of these automatically up to you know, a maximum value if you want. Say, oh, I, only, I should only have maximum 50 OCSP responders. And then you, it can do that uh, pretty nicely for you. Uh, the second DevOps thing, which we have uh, talked a lot about uh, last year, is uh, signing, code signing where you have uh, you know, a 
best practice development methodology which everyone uses is you have your developers who commit to a Git repository, and then you have a continuous integration server, uh, typically quite commonly a Jenkins server in our case, that pulls for every commit to the Git repository. It tests the code, uh, run the regression tests, etc. And if those pass, it can call down to get the code timestamped and signed, and then be ready to be released. In, uh, in many cases, of course, you want some final step uh, in the release process. Uh, either, I mean, if you release nightly builds or if you release make uh, specified releases, you have some uh, checks and, and boundaries there. But you can integrate and automate uh, code signing uh, quite nicely. Uh, my last hardcore slide is uh, Curve 25519, which we have received or started receiving a bunch of questions about uh, more than a year ago. You know, do you support or when will you support Curve 255519 uh, in PKI? Um, back then, you know, there were no real RFCs. So now there's RFC 8410 for just the object identifiers to put in a certificate that came out in August 2018. There were, of course, some drafts before, and we got questions before August 2018. And then there's RFC 8032 for ED DSA, which is not EC DSA, which is from January 2017. So all this is fairly new. So in the beginning, it was like, okay, I don't know, we can generate a curve. Uh, 25519, but doesn't really, there's no really good standardized way to use it in a certificate. Uh, now there's starting to appear, of course, but then for a serious PKI deployment, you also want to use it in an HSM. And uh, this ED DSA is not available in PKCS 11 before PKCS 11 3.0, which I believe there are, it's not even finalized yet, or it hasn't been released, I think. It was supposed to be released about this now, but we'll see. And there's definitely going to take time for HSM vendors to start using uh, PKCS 11 3.0 before, before you can use it. So if anyone wants to play more with uh, EDDSA, feel free to contact us if you have some real use cases for it. I uh, would be interest, uh, interested to learn more. And questions? We have microphones, so please, uh, uh, please raise your hand if you have some questions. We have uh, a question or two that was submitted. Uh, just need to figure out how to find it. Yet some of the suggested that maybe you are wrong, maybe 42 is equal to PKI, <laughs> then, then, then the previous equation is correct and then even your later on one. Yeah, so maybe we need uh, 42 uh, megabyte large keys at least when post-quantum. Sure, yeah. Comes. Uh, uh, why did the uh, public CS not use this new feature, the, the, the CT? What was what's the reason? Is it too complex for them to implement the yeah, computational power? Yeah, as far as I un know, it's more uh, the complexity of operating a certificate transparency log is uh, not small. So it's a, it's a lot of load and a lot of operational uh, infrastructure behind it. So uh, they have established a sharding scheme and nobody really wants to do, you know, start with new complex thing as they are almost struggling already to uh, keep everything running as it is or getting used getting used to running it smoothly. So we have a question also about uh, how's the roadmap on the post-quantum algorithms <laughs> uh, support in general for the CAs? Uh, do, you see, do you see something there happening? Absolutely. And, uh, we will have that more in the PKI talk. There will be a slide on post-quantum mm -hmm. uh, plans. I think uh, there will be, I estimate we will do some proof of concepts in 2020, for sure. Mm -hmm. So we are started looking into, you know, what are the best, uh, well, what are reasonable to do, and uh, there will surely be some 
uh, proof of concept coming within a year or something like that. Any questions from the audience? Please just raise your hand. We will be handed the, the mic. You're not, uh, uh, in that case, then, uh, if you don't have any questions, or have I missed anybody here, uh, please let me know. Uh, uh, in that case, Thomas, thank you very much. Uh, uh,